The owners of this home are moving house. Their whole house. What have we done? <laughs> but will the home of their dreams survive nightmare near misses on an airport runway? Oh, <laughs> there you go. And brushes with disaster in the woods. Uh, compared to like an invasion of Normandy, there's just so many things happening at once. This historic hall weighs more than a million pounds and is on the verge of falling down. These bricks, they did a test on them, and they're about the texture of dirt. Do they dare move such a crumbling brick edifice? You have to fool the building into thinking it's not being moved. Both crews are on red alert as they brace themselves for crashes. Being out on the highway, you got to keep your eyes open, that's for sure. Splashes. Chuck it. And dashes. Chuck it! Chuck it! Two mammoth mansions, two teams with a mission to move them. Every day across the world, buildings are on the move. Sometimes people just want a change of view. This century-old mansion is crossing the river to a new lot on the other side of town. Occasionally, people need a change of neighbors. The new setting for this house promises to be much more peaceful. But once in a while, movers face the daunting task of rescuing a precious piece of history. The University of Virginia in Charlottesville was designed by Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson's buildings were architecturally and technologically ahead of their time. One of the most advanced buildings for its day was Varsity Hall. Built in 1857, it was one of America's first hospitals. Designed with a unique ventilation system, it housed patients with respiratory illnesses. Unfortunately, it stands in the way of a massive new teaching center. The hall's too important to demolish, so the university has decided to move it. They want to haul it 200 feet down a steep hill to the heart of the campus, where it will be fully restored. The task is so technically challenging that America's top mansion mover, Jerry Matico, estimates it will cost $2 million. I'd heard about the job before I'd even gotten here, and a couple movers backed out because they said the grades were too steep. They didn't have ways to hold the building back properly. Varsity Hall is a dauntingly heavy brick structure with 30 rooms, so Jerry's options are limited. There are three basic ways of moving this thing. Number one is to cut it in sections. Slicing it up into smaller chunks makes the hall easier to handle, but cutting thick stone walls is easier said than done. In masonry buildings, it can be done, but it's very hard, especially an old building. With enough patience and stamina, there's another way. The second method, take it apart brick by brick, board by board, put it back together. Moving each of the hall's 200,000 bricks one by one is the only fail-safe way to guarantee delivery. A colossal task, but it's been done before. It took almost a year to move this historic cottage brick by brick 18 years ago. Unfortunately, the crew made an indelible error. They numbered the bricks with permanent ink. Today, the cottage in St. Louis is on the move again. This time, it travels intact to its new home in a historic village. Movers like the Maticos prefer to shift buildings wholesale to preserve the structure as it was originally built. But this is much riskier when the building's made of stone. The smallest bump in the road or a rogue tree branch in its path could cause a fatal crack in the brickwork and make the whole building collapse. 
and the bigger the building, the harder it falls. This could be Jerry's toughest mission yet. It calls for precision surgery. We're gonna separate this building right about the base of this window, right here. Jerry's working out where to cut the building away from its foundations. From here up, it's gonna be moved. From here down, it's gonna be totally demolished after we pick the building up. Jerry will thread 20 steel beams through the hall's basement walls to form a super strong lifting rig. 12 hydraulic jacks aligned underneath will prise the building up off its footings. He needs to cut over 100 holes in the basement walls for the steel girders. This will cause structural weaknesses that worry project manager Joe Jakobic. We're cutting holes for these beams. Okay, they'll run right through, through the entire building. And what that means is I'm cutting out about half the support that the building already has. Cutting through a two foot thick masonry wall should be hard work, but it's like slicing through cheese. Jerry's worst fears are confirmed. You come over to this section, you could probably take this pocket knife here and take the whole brick wall down. You can tell these bricks are nothing. They could take this brick and put it in a bucket of water and the water would bubble for about 15 minutes. It's like a sponge. The more holes they cut in this disintegrating building, the weaker it becomes. Normally, when you have halfway decent brickwork, you can put your beams up and you can lift the building without a problem. Now, in this particular case, with, with the material being so poor, with the cavities in the wall, we need as much surface area covered on the underside as we can. Building the steel cradle is a dangerous challenge. Each beam weighs more than three tons. To thread each one through the internal walls of the building to the other side requires great precision. While Jerry swings the steel, his son Gabe steers it through the hall. Well, just tell me which way to go. Well, listen, back up. We're going to put this thing in that skinny hole there, like threading a needle sometimes. You've got to be very careful. And you have to remember the bricks are pretty rotten. If this large beam slides sideways and hits one of these walls, uh, it can take the whole wall out. To retain the building's strength, Joe's cut the holes as tight as possible. If you twist, you take beam? both walls out. How far are you from the beam? Five foot. OK, we get it. Am I right over it? Come on. Get it over How we go? Easy now. That was tight. Building the cradle is backbreaking work, and if any of these beams are in the wrong position, the building could fall down. You have to fool the building into thinking it's not being moved. It seems like that's a silly concept, but it's really true. In other words, you keep the bottom of that building level, plain, and supported at all times, as close to as possible as the way it sits now. Not all houses are so hard to haul. 3,000 miles away in Vancouver, the Nickel Brothers sell wooden homes to go. This is actually a lot of fun for a lot of people. It's like a car lot only with buildings. So uh, yeah, I mean, this basically is a turn of the century craftsman style bungalow, hedge grain, Douglas fir, beautiful buildings. This one's actually been completely upgraded. These houses were all due for demolition but the Nichols buy them for a dollar and haul them to this lot for resale. Today, the Daigle family is looking for a large recycled home of their own. Buyers like the Daigles can walk away with this cottage for just 25,000 Canadian dollars. That price includes delivery, so it's much cheaper than building a new home. 
the house that we have right now, we only have three bedrooms, and the three boys are all sharing one room. And so it makes it a little difficult. So we want to try to find a house with more rooms. The Daigles live on a farm. Their animals have 32 acres to roam free, but Darren, Tanya, and their four kids are cooped up in a three-bedroom duplex. The boys have had enough of room sharing. We got a double on the bottom and a single on top, which is not very much space. And our closet is full of like vacuum cleaners and things. This is like the best of both worlds. It's an old world frame. This Victorian show home has caught their eye, but they're a little uncertain. They're still a little bit taken aback by seeing something that's up in the air on steel. Like the door? I often see people having a reaction to it. I mean, they walk very timidly through the building. What do you think? They figure that maybe it'll fall nice. over if they get in it, and then hey, they're more the careful. Wow. It's a security thing. Is you're taking something that's, you know, it's an envelope, it wraps their families. It's a security blanket, and you're, you're putting it in a, in, a, in a more tenuous situation. How many rooms are there in this house? There's eight bedrooms, eight bathrooms. Ooh, cow. This building would have been demolished. It was a last minute save. It makes perfect sense when you're getting these quality houses to reuse as much as possible. You're kind of getting a better wood frame construction than you could possibly build or buy nowadays. These have already proven the test of time. They've been against the elements for, in some cases, 100 years, and they're still good to go. Oh, I like this house. This is nice. It's almost double the square footage of our current house. Yeah. And it's got a lot of nice levels on it. What do you guys think? Good. Yeah, I like it. Pretty good. A lot of bathrooms. Well, yeah. There's seven toilets so Seven? Far. Seven so far. There's, there's one each, including the dog. Holy cow. <laughs> At just 125,000 Canadian dollars, the Daigles think it's a bargain. Well, this house really satisfies our needs. It's got the style that we're looking for, lots of room for the children. Oh, I'm really excited. I love this house. I can't wait because I'll have my own bathroom. But before they can move in, they have to haul their dream house home. The only problem is that the housing lot in Victoria is 130 miles south of the Daigles farm in Courtney. An undercarriage and truck are all a wooden house needs to get rolling. The hazards for mover Jeremy Nickel lie on the long road ahead. Unfortunately, we can't move during the daytime while we have the sun shining on us. We're going to be moving at nighttime because we're going down the main highway here in Victoria. Uh, the, we have to go at a time that there's the least amount of traffic, which is between 2 and 5 a.m. in the morning. The first dangerous obstacle for any house leaving the Nichols Yard is the interstate highway. Jeremy has to cross over a deep ditch to reverse the house onto the road. Although this house is very long, he's promised not to block both traffic lanes. He'll need to watch out for careless drivers en route and clear the road before the rush hour begins. A mile down the road, he plans to avoid the town by taking a shortcut through Victoria International Airport. Any delay and he'll miss the 30 minute window he's arranged to taxi the house down the runway. He needs to be there by 5 a.m. when the airport will already be operational. It's four in the morning and Jeremy's team have an hour to motor the house to the runway. The plan of attack here guys is to take the ramps and lay them on about a 30 degree angle from our parking lot out into the highway there, okay? Gary, we're uh, gonna need you down at that end there, shutting down traffic. You know the routine, no one gets by. We're going down to shut the highway down so we can back the house out. You don't get hit. <laughs> yeah, this is one of the more sensitive jobs is actually traffic control. Gary's seen uh, just about everything. Throwing rocks at you and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> If you get on the highway, you got to keep your eyes open, that's for sure. While Gary closes one side of the interstate, Jeremy's team build a makeshift bridge from the lot. Those are our steel ramps. We're going to use those to move the building across the ditch and onto the highway. The main thing we're going to be watching for is that we don't spin out with our truck and lose traction. If we do, we'll have to put a winch truck in behind to help pull. The uh, second thing we'll be watching for is to ensure that the building 
doesn't rock too much and that we keep it fairly plumb and level. No, that looks good. Happy with that. They've got the highway shut down, so let's put her on the road. Radio check, Fred, radio check. Keeping the house level and rolling at a steady speed is crucial. Straighten out, straighten out. Left hand down, left hand down. It's tall and traveling on a narrow wheelbase. Follow it hard, Fred, follow it hard. A sudden jolt or loss of power could cause the house to topple. Good, like that, backing up, you're starting to climb. That's good. Okay, let's straighten that driver rear dolly. Driver the rear house dolly. backs out onto the road, kitchen first. The rear is light and makes the transition smoothly. How much you got, Sally? But just when things seem to be going well, the front wheels carrying the heavier half of the house lose traction. Yeah, unfortunately, it's a little slick here. I was a little concerned about traction, so we're going to put the winch truck in behind, give it a little nudge for about six feet, and we'll be up and away. Watch yourself on that cable, partner. Okay, back right away here. Okay, Brandon, if you can hear me, up on the winch, up on the winch, up, up, up. Jeremy urgently needs extra pulling power. First, he tries the winch, but it's not enough. Are you backing up, Fred, or what's happening? Nothing's happening back here. The house is stranded, so he calls in the emergency crane. I'm not sure why, but our winch powered out there, so we had to use the crane. A little bit more oak with the hydraulic cylinders. Coming down on the road, coming down on the road. Coming down onto the road, nice and easy. The house rocks precariously as the crane hauls it onto the road. We lost about 20 minutes there on the ramps when we spun out. We probably made about five or 10 of that uh, up. So uh, we're probably about 10, 15 minutes behind. Looks pretty good, looks pretty good. While Jeremy picks up speed, Jimmy races ahead. I'm trying to pick up some time down the highway. We're just heading over to the gate and uh, Airport security should be there. I'll just let these guys know that we're on our way. Jeremy reaches the airport 10 minutes later than planned. Our time frame was from 5 till 5.30 to be off the runway. We're going to be close to that. I think it must be about 5.10 now. Here they come now. Yeah, you can see them coming around the corner. Wow, what a slow roll. Just going here like no tomorrow. Yeah, he's booting it. Yeah. Here comes a home. <laughs> Honey, you're home. <laughs> He's got just 10 minutes to get down the runway, but the air traffic is busier than he thought. Oh. <laughs> there we go. That's very good. Okay, Fred. With the 525 to Vancouver on its way, they speed down the runway. I think we're we're only about five, eight minutes off our time schedule right now. That's not bad. They finally complete the first stage and park the Daigle's house alongside another bungalow that will be embarking on the next leg of the voyage. We're going to park the buildings here now. Oh, that's going to be going on first, and uh, then this is going to go on next. The road trip for these houses is over. That was the easy part. Now they must cross the water. Back in Charlottesville, Varsity Hall's ventilation ducts are giving Jerry a headache. And you got this void here. And to pick the building up with these voids, you have to fill them in. And then when you start finding voids, you're concerned how many voids are up above it. Varsity Hall's ventilation system is powered from the basement by a boiler that distributes hot air throughout the building. These ventilation shafts are hard to trace and make the building very weak. They could easily rupture during the move and tear the hall apart. And Joe's eyeing up some more weak spots outside. We knew almost from the start that the windows slid up into the wall, which creates additional pockets. And instead of having a box that we're moving that's, that's braced, it's kind of like moving stacks of dominoes. The windows in Varsity Hall are unlike any Joe's seen before. Traditional sash windows open and close within their framework. A concrete lintel usually supports the weight of the brickwork above. But Varsity Hall's windows are very different. 
the two halves open into the wall cavity to allow more ventilation when the windows are wide open. This means there's no room for a brace over the window to support the wall above. So the walls and windows are like freestanding slabs that could easily fall down. The wooden windows are old and weak, so all 50 must be removed. They brace the holes with lumber and bind the brickwork with struts to prevent it collapsing. The name of the game is to spread the load. And what we've done is by tying our horizontal bracing to vertical uprights against the window, we've essentially taken that opening out of the picture. But when they take the windows out, they make an alarming discovery. There's almost nothing holding the two walls together. The cavity runs all the way around the building. Well, you have a building where just about everything that could go wrong is going wrong. To begin with, we have a situation where the walls are, we found, are hollow. Okay, so there's an airspace in between. There's an inner width of brick, an airspace, and then two outer widths of brick. And uh, it's kind of like a house within a house. The cavity means Joe's moving two separate structures at once, a hall within a hall. If they were to lift both walls without bracing them together, the steel rig could rip through the weak bricks. There's one way around this problem, to fill the cavity with grout. This will glue the two walls together and provide a solid ring around the base of the hall when they lift it. Well, the mix consists of cement and water. Just a very milkshake consistency uh, grout. Upstairs, Joe's team okay. starts pouring right, over a thousand way. gallons of grout through holes into the cavity. Start pump. Starting pump. Downstairs in the basement, Carl checks if the grout's on its way down. If I see it leaking out of the wall, I've got to stop him from pumping it, and i got to stop the leak. That one's full. Cool. It's all stopped. Sure it's all stopped. <laughs> the walls are full of cracks, and soon the odd trickle becomes a torrent of slurry. All stopped. They plug the leaks with rags. There must be no gaps in this concrete base when the grout sets. But the team's troubles are far from over. As the last holes are plugged, the weather turns. The cold snap could spell disaster. If the water in the grout freezes before it's set solid, the grout will lose its strength. They must keep the hall warm, but it's full of holes. The only solution is to wrap it up with a makeshift blanket and seal all the openings. Shit asses, they locked the door. They light six super hot heaters to raise the temperature indoors. Uh, right now it's about 85 degrees. You can see how hot it got by the way the thermometer melted. It's so hot down here they're worried a fire could break out, so they put Jamie in charge of night watch. I have a 14-hour shift of making sure the heaters are running, so therefore the grout don't freeze. But you gotta love it. It all pays the same, right? Except for when you get past eight and you get time and a half, it really gets good. <laughs> There's only one snag with this plan. The hall is rumored to be haunted, and Jamie's scared of ghosts. This is pretty old, man. It could be haunted, who knows, you know? Seriously, I never wandered past the second floor, though. Go up there, I ain't, I ain't screwing around, man. <laughs> I'm here to watch this floor, not the other two. Over on Vancouver Island, Jeremy's awaiting a barge. It's much quicker to haul huge loads by sea than by road, but timing the house loading with the tides is critical. Our high tide begins at 7.30 a.m. and then ends at 10 a.m. At 10 a.m., the, the tide begins to drop quite rapidly. So that means we need to make sure that that barge is gone by 10 a.m. He needs to move fast, but he also knows he has to go slowly. 
Jeremy must guide both houses up a steep, narrow ramp onto the barge. The bungalow will be the first to board. The weight of the houses will cause the barge to sink several feet. And just offshore, underwater, lies a treacherously high sandbank. If Jeremy misses high tide, he risks being grounded on the sandbank. Whenever possible, the Nichols barge two buildings at once. It's cheaper that way. The bungalow boards easily, but the Daigle's house is twice as heavy and much taller. Jeremy dare not move too fast, but has only an hour of high tide left. We want to make sure we're lined up with the ramps really well. And uh, we're watching for our dollies to ensure that we've got full tire coverage on the ramps. Just starting to climb right now. Back dollies climbing. One axle's up, second axle's climbing. Third axle's climbing. Fourth axle starting to climb. Keep it moving, keep it moving. We go very slow. All of the, the moving trucks have extra transmissions in them, so everything's in low, low gear. If it was to happen too quickly, things would begin to rock and become a little unstable. So it'd be like hitting a speed bump going too fast. One axle down on the barge. As the, the rear wheels under the building, begin to make that transition from the ramps onto the barge. At that point, the maximum amount of weight will hit the bow of the barge, forcing the bow down. The extra load causes the barge to sink very low, which worries the tugsmen. We should have been a little bit farther back here. And with the weight of this house, we're probably touching on the corner here. So it's, it's a race against time. Back it up. We got six feet, five feet, four, three feet, two, one foot, first axle coming on the barge. Looking good, looking good. Second axle's on the barge. We're on the boat with the building. We're on the boat with the building. With the houses loaded, they race to secure them before the tide goes out. The barge is going to move around a little bit, so you want to make sure that all of your blocking is secured. It's, uh, everything's on flat, and it's not going to roll on you. OK, away she goes. Let her go. As far as we're concerned here in Victoria, we're passing the torch on. The last leg of the relay race is to my brother in Nanaimo, and uh, he's going to pick it up there with his crew and uh, deliver those buildings safely to their new homes. A 130 miles up the coast, Jeremy's brother Alan is preparing to meet the barge. The Daigle's hometown has no dock, so Alan's looking for a landing site on a nearby beach. Basically, we have four foot, ten and a half inches there. I need to determine that there's enough water to bring the barge in and get it close enough so I can unload it off the barge. The nearest road is 100 feet from the sea. Alan will have to build a firm, temporary road across the beach to the shoreline. If the tide doesn't rise high enough, they won't be able to unload the houses. And the weather can cause problems too. It can get very rough in here. And a large building, especially if you have a two, three story building, it becomes a big sail uh, on the barge. So it, uh, it can be dip very difficult for the tugs to control. It's not too often we get blindsided by a, a storm or a wind that's not going to be negotiable. Generally speaking, what we advise people is that they can leave the furniture in the house. We'll ask them to take the pictures off the walls and take a few things off the shelves, especially if they're priceless ornaments. But we've had uh, people who have just on purpose have left a half a glass of wine sitting on the counter, loaded a house in Victoria, sent it up island, it's arrived there and the half a glass of wine is still sitting on the counter in the glass. With his house gliding north rapidly, Darren realizes he's nowhere near ready. He hasn't started digging the foundations. In fact, he's only just deciding where to put the house. Well, right now it's Monday at uh, 11.30 in the morning. 
and the house is going to be delivered in less than 48 hours. It's nerve-wracking. I didn't sleep much last night, and uh, I think there'll be a few sleepless nights knowing that this house is coming. The inside pegs are the actual footprint of the house. And I put them in there to have a look at it to see if the orientation of the house was nice, what the views would be. We didn't want the house uh, really facing in that direction there because the trees and things are a little bit dead in this area. So you want to have a fairly attractive uh, exposure for the house. With the position marked out, Darren starts digging. The foundations must be at least four feet deep and must match the ground plan of the building precisely. And there's another problem. The new family home is so big, it won't be able to squeeze down the driveway. This main driveway was not wide enough and it had to be solid enough to support the whole house. So we've excavated the ditch and some truckloads of gravel have been brought in. You can't afford to have any lean at all with the trailer. We have to make sure that the soil is absolutely compact before we start bringing the house across. Meanwhile, the crew in Charlottesville have discovered yet another problem that may jeopardize Varsity Hall's move downhill. One wing of the hall has split off from the rest. There's nothing tying this tower in to this house. It has walked off in the past. You can look and see where the caulking gets wider and wider the farther you go up to the wall. It's like a big V. They found out the tower on the east wing of the hall was added much later and is poorly attached. If the building tilts too far as it descends the slope, the tower could fall off. So they're tying it to the main structure with steel cables. You can see all our cables and our bracing to keep this from walking out. Now it's not going to walk out. That's belts and suspenders. They're worried the cables might slice through the crumbling walls, so they protect each corner with wood. To prevent the exterior walls falling away, they run more cables through the inside of the building to pull everything in. Two and a half thousand feet of cabling is strapped together with more than 700 clamps to form a giant steel spider web that holds the whole building together. The spider web of cables actually holds the two sides of the building together and the front and the back of the building together. As this is going down the hill, it is going to tip a little bit. Again, the bracing will prevent the walls from busting loose on us or pushing outwards. After four months of hard work, Varsity Hall is finally braced for its lift. Jerry's still very nervous about the state of its bricks. What you're going to have to watch when we start picking it up is how many of these bricks are going to fall down in between these beams because there's nothing bonding it together. He's packing the gaps around the beams tight. Any bricks falling out during the lift could cause the building to lurch. Say we just loosely wedge up and it's not really tight. Any deviation in your picking spot between one spot and another, it'll cause one spot to pick before the other spot picks. And when you do that, you start stressing the walls and, and causing the walls to flex. And with the old building like this, that's brick or masonry, the walls don't flex. When they flex, they crack. 12 jacks will prize the building up off its foundations. The weight of the hall is unevenly spread, so each one will lift a different load. Hydraulics link each jack to a pressure gauge. At central control, Jerry can adjust the force he applies to each one. We've got the 12 jacks. The pressure goes through the hoses to each one of these gauges. If it's jack one, we have a certain weight, jack two, three, right through 12. They all have their own weights. Jerry assigns a spotter to each jack. They're on the lookout for a hairline crack. This will appear on the building when each jack has taken up its load. You work certain jacks, okay. somebody else will work certain, that way you don't miss any. All right. And I know who to blame if you screw up. Exactly. And if you do a good job. If you see a hairline crack, let me know. Jerry starts up jack one. 
All right, tightening up to 2,000 PSI. All right, going to 3,000. Gabe spots the first hint the corner's lifting. The jack is locked okay. off. Lock off A1. A1, we're locking off A1. He repeats the process for each jack until a giant crack extends around the whole building. Now the entire weight of the hull rests on 12 jacks, so phase two of the lift can begin. These black knobs, we lock them off and we push the lever the other way and everything comes up together. Everything's locked off, you're ready to go unified, right? All jacks are now lifting in unison. Jerry watches the pressure gauges anxiously. If a jack fails or a crack grows in the wrong direction, he will have to react quickly. Over the course of an afternoon, the entire building rises four feet above its foundations. Right now I'm looking for a sledgehammer. <laughs> sledgehammer time. With the lift complete, they clear away the old foundations to make way for the 152 wheels that will carry it on its journey down the hill. After months of laborious work, the building's finally ready to roll. It's 5 a.m. and the Daigles house has finally arrived in Courtney, but the barge is still a long way from Allen's ramps. We're right, Portage right there right now. Give it a little bit more time, we'll suck it again. Basically, we're gonna need uh, a little bit more water to get, in order to get the barge in closer. A couple, three feet would be nice. They'll have to wait for high tide, but this will give Allen a two hour window to unload before the tide turns. His timing is critical. Allen needs to be extra vigilant. If the ramps suddenly sink or slide, the top heavy load could fall over. Just watching everything, the ramps, make sure they don't start kicking out. This happened to a move team two years ago. This Tudor Revival mansion was docking when the ramps underneath suddenly gave way. Fire Chief Rob Meissen saw the disaster unfold. The homeowners had their champagne poured, ready for celebration, and, and only to see their dream home fall into the uh, bay. And we were happy that no one was injured, but uh, it was a terrible event. I mean, a beautiful home and all the plans of the family. Dawn breaks to reveal the Daigle's house has had a safe landing. But there's still one more hazard the house must negotiate, a tight squeeze through a narrow tree-lined track. Unfortunately, overnight, Darren's carefully dug foundations have turned into a swimming pool. He's hit the water table. We may have to bring a pump in and dig a trench from the foundation away from the site and maybe even pump the water out to keep up with keeping the water out of the site as we're excavating. It's critical the new site is firm and level. A local inspector is on site to check Darren's progress. If you don't compact uh, the depth of fill properly, one corner goes down more than another corner and you get what's called differential settlement and then the house starts to break itself apart. So it's telling me that it's uh, about 91 and a half percent. So that's not quite enough yet because they need to make some more passes. It's 7.30 in Charlottesville and the morning of the move. A steep gravel slope points the way down to the hall's new site. Joe and Jerry warn the team of the dangers ahead. 
Something starts acting funny, starts going a little too fast, and somebody says, chalk them, grab a block, set it in place. And you don't put your hand under the block. Gentlemen, watch the perimeter of the building. The brickwork is very loose. We don't want anybody struck by a brick, and make sure you keep your hard hats on at all times. To stop the hull sliding down the hill, they use heavy machinery to anchor it at the rear. All right, we're ready to go. Here we go. While Jerry drives the wheels outside, All right, coming in. Gabe steers them from underneath. Hold back on it. It's dangerous down here. A sudden jolt could bring a wall down on them. If the beams start shifting around, you hear a bunch of noise over your head, uh, then something's being overloaded or something. The load's being shifted, and, and, and that's not supposed to happen unless you're going over a big dip or a bump or anything like that. But I mean, we've got a big, huge, you know, compacted runway, so that really shouldn't happen. So. All right. What's wrong? Oh, Dad. Oh, stop. 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 Everybody stop. Yo. Any of them spinning? Jerry dare not move faster than a few inches a minute. Going ahead. As it leaves its foundations, the hull is so heavy that it sinks into the gravel slope. Hold up, Pop. What's wrong? If the corner sinks any Nothing further, moving. a crack could fracture the wall above. All right, the dolly's flattened out. All right, let's check it. Hold it right there, Gabe. It's rained the last couple of days, so usually this stuff, when it's really dry, packs down kind of hard as concrete. But it's a little, uh, a little wetter, so you want as much traction as you can get so that uh, wheels don't. Uh, sink down in the gravel like uh, they did back there. They lay down wooden boards to haul the mansion out of the hole. OK, here we go. How you doing, Dad? Doing OK? Yeah, we're doing fine. The boards give the load extra grip, but they're time consuming to lay. It's taken three hours to move just what? 30 What's feet, wrong? and there's a long way to go. What's wrong? All right, we're going to come off of this right now, because gonna we'll be boarding all damn day. All right, Gabe, we're going to come on off of this, get up on this road bed. Jerry leaves them behind Everybody and begins the downhill up. run unimpeded. He picks up speed. Rolling a foot every minute, the hull suddenly starts to slide, taking the bulldozers with it. Chuck it! 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 They catch it in the nick of time. The whole road went crazy. OK, here we go. All right, everybody get them back. When they set off again, they proceed more cautiously, stopping every two feet to check the rig. So they start checking the alignment of the wheels as we go. Go a little bit, check it. Go a little bit, check it. Go a little bit, check it. It takes the entire afternoon to inch down the slope. Guiding the building onto its new foundations requires absolute precision. If they're a fraction of an inch out, the toilets won't flush. Gabe's marking out where the front of the hall should come to rest. He'll align it with this plumb bob hung on the front edge. And you have to hit the spot right on the money because, you know, once you get right up on it, you're there. The further down the hill they travel, the steeper the incline becomes. An army of extra spotters look out for cracks or falling masonry. The hall lurches precariously forward as it nears its new footings. It is a little disconcerting to see it leaning like that. If it tilts, it's OK, as long as it doesn't do this. This is where we have problems. The closer they get to the final mark, the less room they have to line up. With just 30 feet to go, they need to wrench the hall to the right by six inches. You got a foot right here. A last-minute lurch on these blocks could be tricky. 
Joey! Yeah! Get a block ready! You got one, okay? Yeah, I got it! Right on the foot, Bill. He said, let off a mark, let off a mark. How much? Eight inches. How many inches we gotta go ahead? Two? Keep her slack. It up now. It's not going anywhere, anymore, nowhere for a hundred years. We well, think, Joe. Congratulations. Good job. That was slick, Jerry. A little slow start, but it came all right. Well, actually, it was starting to go fast. Yeah. You had to slow it down. You had to slow it down. After a nerve-wracking day, Varsity Hall finally reaches the end of the road. Over the coming months, it will be restored to its former glory. Back on Vancouver Island, the Daigles House sets off on the final leg of its trip through the forest. It's got a very tight location going basically uh, inches to work with. This narrow bridge makes dodging heavy branches impossible. The house windows are going to be lucky to survive this. If the edge of the house were to get caught on these sidings, it could fall overboard. You might just need up a tad to my side. They raise the house up just to be safe. The house has to squeeze past power cables, too. I'm just trying to take some of the weight off of it against the house. That's the tightest spot on the whole route, so, uh, so I'm always happy to get through the tightest spot. <laughs> With the main town behind them, they head out into the open country roads. The 130-mile trek is almost over. The power must be shut off so the house can make the final turn into the Daigle's driveway. <laughs> For the Daigles, this is a day they'll never forget. The neighbors, they thought we were kind of crazy, but here it is. Oh, that was another piece of the yeast trough. Oh well, I'll pick it up later. I was a bit nervous, and I don't think you know until you see your house come in on wheels. It's really strange. And uh, yeah, I love this house. Hey Tanya, we have a broken window. It's kind of amazing to see it came here with just like one broken window and that's it. Yeah, that's not bad. One, one window's not too bad. <laughs> that's wild. Home Sweet Home is finally home. I can give you the key for this. If you like. Oh, that's the key for the house. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. After weeks of high anxiety, the Daigles can finally enjoy their new family home. <laughs>